you have entire swathes of population who had nothing to do with 9-11. And that is why you get this fury. The debate has begun. We are at a crossroads. Here is the challenge of our times. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor of two kinds of society in the 21st century. Here you have the thistle representing tribal society. And all of us, in one way or the other, come from tribal societies going back to biblical times, where honor, where family, where kinship, where custom, all these things matter, the community, face-to-face -face societies. And then you have the drone, which is a kind of sleek, you invisible kill te technology. It's a very advanced kill technology. It's so, so advanced that we don't even know very much about it. And you see these two symbols clashing head-on in the 21st century. And of course, there is no match because the tribesman doesn't even know when, how, and where he's going to be killed. And you have a lot of these drone operators sitting in the Midwest somewhere in the United States looking at their screens and, and just chit-chatting as if though they're playing God. This is probably the first serious study which looks at both sides of the war on terror, which is the American side with its allies, which include many Muslim countries like Pakistan, like Afghanistan, and the other side, the tribes, the peoples who are involved in it. Uh, very often the discussion simply assumes that there's one side to the debate, and in fact there are two sides. So this study brings the two sides together so that we're able to understand who we are dealing with and how to effectively check the violence and win the war on terror in a more sophisticated, in a more permanent way, and in a more successful way than has happened so far. The drone policy begins somewhere after 9-11, I think a couple of years later. In fact, 2004 is when the drones really begin to uh, hit uh, Waziristan in the tribal areas of Pakistan. The impact of the drones has been devastating and counterproductive. So if we are killing five or 10 or 15 militants, we are also creating another 100, 200, 200,000 even uh, enemies for the United States. So someone has to do the mathematics and say, while this is very successful in keeping American troops and boots off the ground and American, uh, American safe, um, this is a remote control kind of warfare, new kind of warfare. At the same time, the costs are enormous. And those costs haven't really been uh, calculated yet. And I believe the fact that it's create, creating so much uh, disturbance and uh, upheaval and violence in neighboring societies and causing entire nations to feed into a sense of anti-Americanism in the end may be extremely costly for the United States. The war on terror has been conducted and analyzed since 9-11. Most commentators talk of it as a war with basically a form of Islam, militant Islam or fundamentalist Islam. And yet, the more I studied the subject after 9-11, the more I realized that the tribal underlay of these societies was being overlooked. For example, of the 19 hijackers on 9-11, 18 are Yemeni tribesmen. And of those 18, 10 are from the Assyri region of South, South Saudi Arabia, all of one particular tribal group. Osama bin Laden himself is of the Yemeni tribe. And what does Osama, Osama give to us? He gives lots of clues as to the purpose of the war while we assume it's Islam. He's constantly talking of tribe, tribal honor, tribal revenge, tribal code. And in fact, the two houses he lived in in the last decades of his life in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, one is called Gandhi House after the Yamani tribe that he associated with. Many of his supporters came from there. And the second house is called Waziristan House after the tribes which supported him. So this should be giving us huge clues as to his thinking. Therefore, if the problem is to be seen in a tribal context, if that is the problem, surely the solution should also be sought there. And because we are not looking in a tribal context, we are missing the solution.